I really do want to express my personal thanks, and I'm sure reflects that of the congregation. Your, the work that you do week after week, year after year, to enhance our worship services and provide examples for us at church leadership and church service, I thank you. It's really, it's really a pleasure. As most of you all know, but in case you don't, and in case you may be a visitor here, our senior minister, Jeff Timms, submitted his resignation a little over two weeks ago, and his last day of work here was this past Wednesday. And now I think it is appropriate and right and just that we celebrate and give thanks for the many accomplishments that Jeff has done in his less than three years here at Kings Highway. Jeff was the impetus behind the starting of the Hispanic ministry. He was responsible for the restructuring of the church staff, including the hiring of our first parish nurse. He helped guide a lot of the refurbishing of the physical plant here, including the carpet, the pew cushions, paint jobs, new sign on the corner. He provided guidance and support that has led the contemporary service to unprecedented success and numbers. And we could go on and on and on. But Jeff was called here to be at this church at that time three years ago. And I think he served the church. He was a man of God. But let me quote to you from Jeff's newsletter article, and it was also in his resignation letter. Most pastors have a sense of when their work is done. I feel that moment has come. I have appreciated the love, support, and encouragement that you have given me during some hard times in my life while I was here. I shall look back at this time with many fond memories. Jeff truly got some things, many things, accomplished while serving with us here at Kings Highway. But the reality this morning is that he has gone from us and we are here. And I think it leaves with us at least two major concerns. And the first is, what is going to happen to Jeff? Jeff's life changes in the past year have been many. And I believe that he is entering into a new phase of his life with many new possibilities for fulfillment and service. And I think I spoke for all of you all when I prayed for Jeff and for the happiness and joy in his life. The decision to resign a senior, mentorship, senior ministership has many complexities to it, and it's not an easy, cut-and-dried, black-and-white decision. I know there were a lot of factors that went into it. But I want to share with you that week before last, Jeff and I were alone, and I asked him exactly what it was that was causing him to leave. And he told me that the plans that he and Glenda, his fiance, had was for her to move down to Shreveport, and then in a couple of years they were going to move back to Durham, North Carolina, where they would be spending the rest of their their days. And he got to thinking about that and about the fact that she would be uprooting herself from her home, her five sisters, her two children, her two grandchildren, and a job that was fulfilling and rewarding and of service. And he said it seemed to make more sense to him that he do the uprooting now rather than her. We trust that God will continue to take care of Jeff and Glenda during this time of many changes. Certainly, we knew him as a gentleman and a gifted teacher. But the second major concern is, selfishly, and very humanly, what is going to happen to us? Now, we must face the unknown. 
And occasionally in times like that, it is natural for us to admit to the fact that we have a troubling sense of uncertainty. And we have to ask questions of ourselves like, did we do anything wrong? What will become of us? Where will we find another senior minister? What is the strength of our leadership here at King's Highway? Should we be afraid? So as we should do, we look to the scriptures for help. Maybe we can find some guidance there. And I read to you from the fourth chapter of Ephesians. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The author of Ephesians loved the church at Ephesus. Ephesus was a good and successful church. Paul stayed there three years. And unlike many of the other epistles which were written to correct and rebuke and bring into line these fledgling churches, these verses to Ephesus go under the heading of exhortations, a series of encouragements, messages that are meant to guide and lift up and to teach. And as the events at King's Highway have unfolded in the past few weeks, I have read these passages and have been reminded of the early church. After all, we are a restoration movement denomination, meaning that this is a denomination that is turned to the early church to see what they did and thought so that we can incorporate as much as we could into our congregational life of the present day. And I think of all the issues that they faced and all the travails that they faced. Not only some persecutions in some places, but assimilation of a number of people from different backgrounds with different teachings. Non-acceptance from the outside world. You have to face the fact that their future as a church had to be uncertain to them. They were largely on their own. There was no governing organization that they could call up on the cell phone and say, hey, we're in trouble. Come on down. We need some help. But this epistle to the Ephesians addresses what they need to do to be church. And that caused me to reflect upon what this church has faced for the past 82 years. 
here at the corner of Kings Highway and Line. Many of you probably can tell the stories better than I can. But I know of some of the travails that we've gone through. Stories about a senior minister who was an extreme racist. Stories about scandals on the church staff. Stories about financial crises. Stories about how if something or other didn't get done, that there were rumors that the church may split. And I have to wonder, how did those congregations cope and react to these difficulties? And how did those who were in leadership positions, how did they lead? What did they do to keep this church strong and faithful and vital in the continuing building of God's kingdom? And I believe that these words from Ephesians provide us a lot of the answers. Listen to these words again to those early churches and to us. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Ultimately, we will no longer be infants subject to the cunning and craftiness of deceitful men. Instead, instead, we will grow up into him who is the head of the church, Jesus. From him, the whole body grows and builds itself in love as each part does its work. So I've looked around this church, scrutinizing myself, scrutinizing our leadership, scrutinizing the rest of us and I want to share with you what I have observed and I believe that I now really understand how in the past we have prospered and endured in times of uncertainty and I now understand how we will prosper and be successful in the future and how we will be faithful and the answer is found in these verses We need only to keep Jesus Christ as the head of this church and treat each other humbly, gently. We will bear each other in love. We will be unified by the Spirit. I know most of you all, and I understand now how we will go through this transition period. I see a people who to an amazing extent all of their years in this church have treated each other with gentleness and humility and love. I see a church who understands that it is not one person or a small group of people who is the head. Rather, they understand that Jesus Christ is the head and we are all part of the body. I see your elected leadership and your unelected leadership who have been given the gifts of pastor and teacher. And it has been my joy and relief to share with you that I have seen this leadership in action and see firsthand just how faithful, honest, and compassionate they are in fulfilling the duties to which they have been called. I see people who understand in practice that each and every one of us is a minister. I see people who understand that they are not here at King's Highway because of some random event. They are here at King's Highway because they were called to be here. That's why you joined. And if we are indeed called, then it is obvious that God has a purpose for us to be here at this time and at this place. So I believe that my church, your church, is in good shape. We have conducted and are conducting ourselves in a very biblically sound and compassionate manner. But that really speaks to the past and the present. What about the future? We've come this far okay, 
But well, what will happen to us in the future? What are we to do? And this is where I'd like to talk to you a little about hope. Stephen Kreitz wrote something I like. As plants arch their stems toward the sun, so human beings twist from ankle to chin toward the future. Not just toward a tomorrow like today and yesterday, but toward the future that never becomes past. The capacity to hope is one of the characteristics that separate human beings apart and different from the rest of other animals. Sometimes we may think of hope as an act of desperation, but that is not true. Hope is based upon our past experiences. We are conditioned by what we have experienced in the past. And based upon that, we have an expectation for the future because of those experiences. When our experiences have been negative, we have despair. When our experiences have been positive, we have hope. Our experiences create our stories of the past. Hope creates our stories for the future. Hope is the present visualization of what we want and expect to happen to us in the future. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, the foundation of our hope is ultimately in the character of God. And what have our religious experiences and our understanding of the gospel tell us about God's character? And the answer is that God loves us more than we can possibly imagine. And he keeps his promises. He is steadfast, and he insists upon loving us despite our seeming inability at times to be able to respond with trust and faithfulness and obedience. Our hope is in our relationship with this trustworthy God whose character is marked by a faithful love for us. So we look at the history of King's Highway and we see all the travails that have happened to us in the past in these eight decades. And based upon our having a faithful relationship with him in the past, what has happened to us? And the answer is, we have prospered and we have survived. And what can we anticipate in the future? And I suggest to you our experiences lead us to our hope and to this conclusion. We know that God is on our side. And he's a loving, gracious creator and redeemer whom you and I can trust with the future. The Lord said to Jeremiah, For surely I know the plans for you, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. No, I don't know exactly and precisely what God has in our future. But based upon our past, and based upon our relationship, and based upon God's character, I am confident that it will be wonderful. So here is my wish for you and for me. Let us remember Ephesians. We need to keep Jesus Christ, the head of the church. We need to continue to treat each other humbly, gently. We should bear each other in love. We are to be unified by the Spirit. And we should use our hope, our hope that is based upon our experiences of being faithful to God, our hope to shape 
our future story of what wondrous things that God has in store for us at King's Highway. Let's pray. Loving God, we ask for your Holy Spirit to guide and encourage us as we focus on loving one another, unifying us in the Spirit. We have hope for our marvelous future, not because of what we do, but because of what you have done and will do for people who are faithful. Be with us in the coming days. We ask this in the name of your Son. Amen.